Have I ever, ever met somebody who said they just, they just want to know God's will? No. Right? I, I, just, I just want to know where God is leading me. I, I was thinking about that this week. People, a lot of people say that. I, I just really want to know God's will. And yet, uh, so many times I, I stopped and I, and I realized that a lot of the people and that, that I've met to say, oh, I want to know God's will. I want to know where God is leading. I want to know who God is. I want to know his direction haven't ever taken the time to read his word. And I think, well, that, that's kind of a curious thing, isn't it? If God has taken the time and um, seriousness to give us his revelation um, over time, that, that we would say that we desire to know his will, but we just won't take the effort to, to learn what he's already given us. And, and I know that all of us can be guilty of that at times, where, where we'll say we want to know God's will, but we won't be willing to listen to what he's already said. Or, or more specifically, sometimes we'll be more concerned about what's God's will on what are really arguably the little things in life, correct? We'll be like, what new car does God want me to buy? You know, if you have that problem, God bless you, right? But, 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 uh, but that being the case, you know, what, what, what color should I paint my house? Um, and, but not being concerned as much with... Um, how should I set my life in the direction I should be going when God has clearly revealed? And so many times we say we want, God's, we want God's will in the little things, which maybe in the grand scheme of things are inconsequential, but we don't seek God's will in the big things about who we are called to be and where our future is. And, and really we need, we need to reverse that, and we need to stop and say, if God has taken the time to show us who he is, then we as people who proclaim to be his followers should take the time to listen to what he has to say. And so we're going to start a new series this summer on a portion of the Bible that I think a lot of you may not have a firm handle on. And we're going to be going through it pretty quickly. And we know it's important because God took, took the time to write and it's part of his revelation. And we're going to be looking at the minor prophets. Um, and those are those books in the end of the Old Testament that you may be, I have no idea what's going on. And we're going to be rushing through them, so we're not going to be exhaustively on Sunday mornings, but what we're going to do is we're going to take a book a week, and we're going to talk about the major theme, how it fits into the biblical record, and what the message is, what applications we can draw from it. And what you can do then is that following week, and I would challenge you to do this, no, no, there's not going to be like um, a star chart in the foyer, well, maybe there should be, though you can mark, I actually did it, right? Because I know a few of you would do it, or at least lie. That's one of the Ten Commandments, by the way. You can't put up stars if you weren't reading. But we're not going to do that. But you can go home, and you can read the book after we talk about it, and hopefully that will give you a greater understanding of what the prophet is actually um, talking about. What was God's message for these people? And to see what we can learn by their example, and what we can learn the timeless truths that God is also revealing. Now, they're called the Minor Prophets. Now, that's not like Major League, Minor League, right? Um, some of you may think of baseball, Minor Prophets, not important. That's not, that's not the case. They're called the Minor Prophets because they wrote less. They were shorter. They, they had a, a message that was more brief than the Major Prophets. Then that's how we divide them up, Major Prophets, Minor Prophets. In fact, the 12 Minor Prophets were all on, on one scroll. And so they'd be, and that's how we, we lump them together as well. Be so at that time period, like the Isaiah scroll, Isaiah was a very copious writer. He is, his writings are on one scroll. But the minor prophets were all put together on one scroll in terms of in the synagogues, and they would keep them together, uh, at least usually speaking. And so we, as we continue to lump them together too, not because their messages were the same or the times that they wrote was the same, but they were the prophets that God has inspired more succinctly. And so we're going to look at it this morning. We're going to do an introduction. We're not actually looking at Hosea, which would be the first of the minor prophets, um, in, in, at least in terms of the order that they are in your Bible. Now today we're going to start explaining how a little bit of these fit. Because what I want you to understand is, like all scripture, it was written to real people with real problems in real time. And the people who understood that message and heard it, it, it probably made more sense than some of it mean, makes to you, um, at least initially, because they knew what God was talking about. Now us, a couple thousand plus years um, removed from the situation, sometimes we have to go back and learn, why was this message being given to this people? And then we can ask ourselves, what similarities do we find? What timeless truths are still there? So let's, we're going to, 
hopefully have a good time with this. It will take us throughout the summer, um, summer with the minor prophets. But uh, I trust it will be very valuable. So who were the prophets? Right? That's, that's something we can talk about. What's, what, are, what are the prophets? Well, prophets are God's messengers. Um, that's one way to look at them. They, uh, you've heard the saying before, maybe you've uttered it, don't shoot the messenger. Right? When you have been, had to go on, on behalf of a boss or somebody else to go give somebody bad news. Not a lot of fun. Where you know, I'm going to get yelled at. And I'm just the go-between. Uh, and don't you love that? You go from your boss's office out to the customer and just going, he's sitting in his office so I can get yelled at right now. It's just a very pleasant experience. And you're thinking, sometimes it's not even what you want to say. But you are required as a, as a good employee, as a good steward of that information, to faithfully communicate it. And that's what God's, God's prophets were. They were God's messengers carrying on the messages of God to speak to the people. See, a, a prophet in the Old Testament was somebody who was used by God to communicate his message to the world. And they were, they were God's mouthpiece. They were the people who said, Thus saith the Lord. And you come here on a Sunday morning. And I, and I use a lot of words. Very few of them are thus saith the Lord. The ones that are thus saith the Lord are when I pick up the Bible and read it straight off the pages. Right? And we understand that. Um, well, even when I read it off the pages, I hope you kind of follow along because sometimes I still tangle up my words, just like the rest of you. You read out loud and what you thought you read out loud isn't what you read out loud. But the prophets themselves, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit and they were sit, give, proclaiming the words of God. And we have a picture of this in the Old Testament. Remember Moses. That's why we have the burning bush here. Moses, what was he doing? He was hiding out on, in the middle of nowhere with sheep. He had been an Egyptian prince because he had been adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. And then he decided that he was going to throw his lot in with the Israelites. And his attempt, which was really in his mind of rebellion, of leading his people out, fell flat. So he ran he threw in the towel, he's herding sheep, and then God shows up. And we see this in Exodus chapter 3. And God speaks to Moses and says, You are to go and to say the words that I'm going to tell you to say. See, he's God's messenger, he's God's mouthpiece. And then that's exactly what happens when he first comes before Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 5, it says, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. That's the first message. They are saying, not what they would speak on their own, but they are, they are charged with proclaiming the words of God. And at times, because these people have this special commission, God would show up in miraculous ways. And we know in the case of Moses, he sent signs and wonders to humble Egypt and to display his majesty and to authenticate his message. Other, other prophets didn't seem to have that. But they still faithfully proclaimed the message of God. And they were led by the Holy Spirit. In a general sense of the word, a prophet is someone who speaks God's truth to others. And there is still the gift, um, we would say, of prophecy. Now, not in terms of inspired prophecy um, you know, for all time, but someone who can proclaim God's truth. There may be those Christians that you run into that just, you know they're right, but they kind of irritate you from time to time. They may have the gift of prophecy. Now, we're not, we're not talking about predictive, predicting the future, but it says, this is what God's Word said, and you need to adjust your life to it. And you're thinking, well, you could be a little less blunt and maybe a little... No, because there's, there's an aspect of God's truth which just needs to be boldly proclaimed. Now, certainly, we need all, all the gifts. We do need people with mercy, right? Because what happens to the, happened to the prophets back then still happens to prophets today. They are hated and killed. And we know that. But they're a very important voice calling us to truth. Um, and so that we have these people in the Old Testament. They were also called seers at time because they could see God's revelation. Um, and they would proclaim, declare God's truth on contemporary issues. And sometimes even revealing his, his truth about the future. And, and that's the part that we think about. And yet, you know what? It's not even the biggest part. Because most of what the prophets said were speaking to the there and now. We get wrapped up when we think, prophets, prophecy, when's Jesus coming back? And that, that's, that's a good question. But not at the expense of what is God calling us to do now. Who is God calling us to be? 
And, and that's largely um, what they would proclaim. Prophets were also called by God to be prophets. So these people who wrote in here, they weren't just 12 guys who one day said, you know what, I've got a few thoughts about God, I'm going to write these down. But they rather had a special commission from God called out. And we see uh, many people called out in special ways. Um, obviously Moses, it was a burning bush, very, very evident. Moses didn't want the job. We have shepherds. We have, you know, minding their own business, saying, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, and yet God called me. You see a lot of other people who weren't that excited about the message, but they were called and they were required to deliver God's message accurately. Um, one of the things that we read, it says, in, in 1 Kings, this is Micaiah. He's not the prophet who wrote something down, but he's, he's in, the, in the Old Testament because not all the prophets wrote. The ones we are studying this, this Sunday are the ones who wrote things that God inspired Scripture. But there are other prophets, such as Elisha, such as Elijah, such as Micaiah. And when Micaiah appeared before the king, he said, As surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell the king what the Lord tells me. Because it wasn't their own editorial. It was the words of the Lord. Um, normally, this was not predictive in nature. And if you even look in your Bible, you've, we've sung the song, um, because we've turned this verse into a song, like I've already said, like Micah chapter 6, 8. It's very practical. And what does Micah say to the people who are listening? It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. See, that was a message for the people, saying, You do not love justice. You do not love mercy and you are not humble. Well, you're like, well, that's pretty practical. It's a little less than the Left Behind series there. No, and, and, but the words are very practical. God will reveal truth, and that's truth for all time, past, present, and future. Um, and we want to make certain that we are walking with him. Of course, God's, God did give words that were indeed predictive of what was going to come. In Isaiah, we read the, the words of God. Isaiah 42, verse 9, what does God say? He says, See, the former things have taken place. And, I, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And God is saying, How do you know I'm God? Let me tell you something. I'm going to do something that's never done. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. Now, people are interested in that, are they not? Otherwise, we wouldn't have psychics. Psychic Friends Network on, like, whatever station, late at night on TV. You're flipping through, and you're like, here we go again. And really, I mean, if the psychics are so psychic, shouldn't they call you? I mean, really? Just like, hey, you know what? I got some news for you. you give me 1999, I've got your message. I mean, they, they should be calling you. But whatever the case being, we know that people are really bad at predictions. I mean, just look at the weathermen, right? Every, every Friday, I'm watching, the, I'm watching the weather report just to see if it's going to rain or not. Um, and this, but it changes. You look at the five-day report, and then you look at the two-day report, and then you look at the day of or the hour before. It changes because we we don't understand what's going to come. But who understands the future? Because he's outside of the scope of time is God Himself, and He says, "I will declare the things before they happen." In Isaiah 46:9, God says again, "Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other." I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. He says, how do you know that I am God? I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to tell you what will happen before it happens. There are, certainly were plenty of false prophets, and there still are. Um, in the time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was proclaiming an unpopular word. It was a word of the Lord. It was not the word that he desired. It was his nation is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. Could you imagine if I just started preaching? Um, this is not a word from the Lord. The United States is going to fall. The United States is going to fall. And if that was really a word from God, a lot of people would be mad. And maybe a lot, maybe a lot of you guys saying, how dare you? criticize our nation. And that's what was going on with Jeremiah, Jeremiah, but even more so because they thought they were under God's special blessing. But he says, we have, we have sinned, we have erred, and now judgment is coming. And the people were like, don't listen to Jeremiah, he's not telling the truth. And other people who proclaimed to be prophets came up and said, God has said he will, he will rescue us. And, and you can read about these in, in the Bible. These other people saying, Jeremiah is wrong. Jeremiah is wrong. God's going to rescue us. 
He won't destroy the temple of the Lord. But we see that the words came to pass. The other ones were found to be false prophets. And what we have to remember, that meant they were not prophets. They were not sent from God. Because the standard for a prophet in the Bible was perfection in accuracy of the delivery. We see that in Deuteronomy 18.22. And perfection in terms of faithfulness to God. Go to Deuteronomy 13. They also had, they had to be faithful to God in terms of the message of who God was, not just in terms of what would happen, and faithful to God in terms of the accuracy, delivering his message um, fully. And so uh, as we look through this, we're going we're gonna to look at some things that, that have happened, but hadn't happened when they were proclaimed. Remember Isaiah 7.14, what's it say? It says, And the virgins will be with child, and you will call his name Emmanuel. It was a prediction about Jesus Christ years 700 plus years before Jesus was born. And then Jesus was born in this miraculous birth, exactly as God has proclaimed it. Now we read that and go, wow, that's pretty amazing. And, and I hope you understand just how, how exponentially impossible the prophecies of the Old Testament happening in the person of Christ were to have happened. You do the math and it's like, you know, exponents to the, to the, the level which is mathematically considered an impossibility. The one person could fulfill all of those. And so many of them couldn't even be fulfilled by like if you're trying. You have to pick the place you're born, pick the tribe you're born to, pick the place. But God knew the end from the beginning, declaring the things which would happen before they happened. And it gives us confidence for the future because there are things that have not happened yet. When Jesus Christ went, in, went into the sky and the angels came down and said, we tell you the truth, he will come back the same way as he's gone. We know that if God fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament, literally, 100%, we know that he will fulfill them in like manner. And we can say in some instances, it hasn't happened yet. But we know it will. Because God has declared it. Ultimately, the prophets of the Old Testament um, reached their culmination. Um, first, we have John the Baptist coming on to, to draw attention to the one who was spoken of in, in Exodus, uh, or, or in Deuteronomy, excuse me, of the prophet like Moses, that Jesus Christ was not just the Messiah, was not just the King, was not just God Almighty, as if that was not enough, but he was also the one, the final mouthpiece of God, being his own messenger. And uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Um, so a lot about prophets. Um, but now as we're going to look at the Old Testament, more specifically the minor prophets, just keep in mind they're kind of the covenant watchdogs. I stole that term from another, another um, preacher that I was watching in studies. So their job um, was to proclaim to the people to make sure they were living accurately in responsibility to what, what God had given them. See, they're part of God's family, essentially. And God said, these are the rules you have to follow. And when you're not, when you are following the rules, I will bless you. When you're not following the rules, you will fall under curses and judgments. And when they were not following the rules, their job was to come and to tell the people, you're out of line. Now, certainly at other times, they would have words for other nations who were outside of the covenant. They would have words of encouragement and hope at times, and words that were far into the future. But they would come out like Elijah, who was not, of course, one of the minor prophets, and speaking against the northern kingdom of Israel because they are sinning against God. Now, once again, nobody likes that kind of messenger. And Elijah was not a very popular guy in the courts of the king. Nevertheless, he was proclaiming the word of God in the hopes that the people would respond. And so the minor prophets that we're going to look at, what we, we need to learn is who is their audience? Because some of these prophecies, which may not make sense to us, um, will make sense when we consider both Israel and Judah, the people they were talking to. We need to uh, look at each individual messenger. Like, who were they? Why, how were they called? How is God using them? and to see what their message is, um, both the message that was pertinent then, um, specifically for those people, and the timeless truths that they spoke to all people. And so we're going to look at this, because in the time of the minor prophets, which you can see up here, uh, the nation of Israel had divided into two countries. We had the southern country of Judah and the northern country of Israel. Um, and so the different books, uh, as we look at the prophet, were written to different audiences at different times. Um, and so what we're gonna what we're gonna see here um, is that 
Hosea and Amos wrote specifically to the northern kingdom. And they were warning the northern kingdom about their gross violation of God's um, covenantal standards. You had uh, prophets like Obadiah and Nahum and, and Jonah, although Jonah is more a telling of his message, um, recording the message that he went to give. But um, their messages were specifically for people outside of the Jewish people, messages on the nations. We put Joel in the middle here. Why do we put Joel in the middle? Because Joel um, talks both about um, God's people as well as the outside nations. He, his message kind of transcends that. Um, then, we have, then we have the prophets to Judah. And we have Habakkuk and Zephaniah preaching to the people in the south and saying, you know, get your act together, in other words. Um, Actually, Habakkuk was kind of like, it's a little too late to get your act together. That's such an encouraging message, too. Uh, but then after God came in, and the northern kingdom first and the southern kingdom later, and were taken into exile as a punishment for their bad behavior, when the people returned to the land, uh, God sent prophets again, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, both rebuking and encouraging the people to get it right this time. And so those are, are the thing. We're, we'll have the same box up. I know some of you are writing, but we're going to add a couple things here. Uh, and just so you're wondering, like, where do those major prophets? We skipped them. Where do they fall in? Well, Isaiah basically proclaimed God's word to everyone. And if you were in JW's class, you see like, lament against Tyre and you know, lament against the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and predictive prophecies of, of Jesus Christ. If you have one book from the Old Testament prophe about prophecy, Isaiah is pretty much the gold standard, not that other prophecies in God's word is less valuable, but it is just absolutely amazing. And it is amazing the way God has preserved that. I know I've said this before, I'll say it again. When people are like, well, you know, they just kind of wrote those things after the fact. Well, that, that'd be really great, except for the fact that God just in his sense of, I don't know, generosity, maybe humor, preserve the Isaiah scroll that they dug up and they pull it out and go, hey, it reads exactly like it used to read 100 years before Christ. Um, and just a way of, of confirming to us the accuracy of his message. Um, Jeremiah Lam Lamentations. Also, the Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. So these are both Prophet Jeremiah. Um, they were preaching to Judah right before they were conquered by the Babylonians. Um, Ezekiel and Daniel were... They were in the process of when Judah was being exiled. Ezekiel started. Um, by the way, and here, here's just a little bit. This is extra. When Judah was exiled, it came in three stages. As, okay. What happened is first, um, at the time of Ezekiel, when there's there's a lot of battles going on in the world scene. First, they were conquered. Well, Josiah was killed by the Egyptian. The Egyptians. They put their own king in charge. It was one of his sons. But they said we're going to pick the next ruler. Doing a little bit of nation building. Um, a, bit, a little bit later, though, the Assyrians were conquered by the Babylonians, and when the Babylonians came into town, um, they took some of the people with them back. It was, it was a first deportation. Later on um, they, is when Jerusalem was destroyed, and they took the majority of the people. But Ezekiel was in the first group, and so he's back already. He is exiled before um, Judah is, is completely vanquished. And so he's, he's got two things. He's giving some words before it's over, and then a lot of messages after the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and Daniel, of course, was in Babylon and later in Persia, and he goes a long time. So um, here's another way of looking at it. I know I, li I like charts, sorry. Um, so if I have an opportunity to give you like introductions and charts and numbers, you just you're like, man, I'm back in history class. But there is no quiz afterward. So, um, so you're, you're, you all get A's just for attending, okay? But here we go. So once again, let's look at this. Here's a timeline. Remember the purple here, which is not labeled. Um, Israel used to be one country. There were the kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. And they were, especially during the reign of, of David in the early part of Solomon, they were serving God. They built the temple. They were being faithful, and they were united, and God prospered them because they were fulfilling the obligations of their covenant. And God was pouring out his blessing as he wanted to pour out their blessing, his blessing. And there were some hard times because David made some big mistakes and it impacted the country. But as a whole, it was a good time. And then Solomon came in. It was even better as God is pouring out his blessings and they built the temple and they're worshiping God. And then something horrible happened in Solomon's own life. As he became proud, he allowed his heart to be turned astray and he began introducing idolatry. And the people themselves began following idolatry. 
And as they stopped serving God, he pulled back his blessings and began to introduce what we call remedial judgments. That means God doesn't normally just come in and blow something up. What he does is he sends little warnings. And um, as those happened, then the northern kingdom split from the southern kingdom. And ten tribes tore away and said, we don't want to be... We don't want to be unified with you anymore. We don't like Solomon's son. So Rehoboam and Jeroboam take the two halves of the country. They're not brothers. Their names are just very similar. And they go different directions. And in the northern kingdom, unfortunately, there was not one good king. And that's why the nation did not go as long. But God sent people to proclaim, to preach, to call them to repentance. But as a whole, they did not listen. In the southern kingdom in Judah, God sent prophets as well. And they were back and forth. They had some good kings, some lukewarm kings, and later, mostly, some really, really bad kings. But they lasted a little bit longer. They should have learned from Israel's example, but they didn't. Um, so we see, first, Israel was conquered in 722 by the nation of Assyria. The people were yanked out of the land and, put, and sent to new homes. So you could just imagine if Canada conquered, I, I like to always imagine Canada coming down from the north, conquering us and dispersed us and sent us to new places like the Yukon. And then they sent other people and, and settled the country. And that's why we actually end up with a problem with the Samaritans later on in, in the Gospels. This is from this time period, a lot of what's going on. But they're conquered, they're moved out. Now one thing to know is not every one of the ten tribes was up there. Some of the people, just like us today, started to see the writing on the wall. And especially those who were observant Jewish people, still being faithful, fled into the southern kingdom. And you see them mentioned later on. You're like, how are these other tribes around in Judah? Because they fled south. They said, we're going south. It's time to go back to Judah. And some of them were still there, preserved that way. Others, of course, conquered by the same countries later on. Well, in Judah, they last until 586. Uh, actually, the, uh, you'll see sometimes 587 will be listed, sometimes 586. It was a, the battle lasted more than a day. Um, and times of years and when they happen, they don't exactly match the uh, English-American um, worldwide calendar of the day. But so as that's when Jerusalem was finally fully destroyed. The, like I said, the deportation started in 605. So there's, there's a time period. But that's when it fully came to its, its culmination. And so the prophets are writing during these times. Uh, that hash mark part, there, that's, that's the exile. So for that period of time, no one's living in the land except for just a few stragglers. But then we see later on that Cyrus allows the people to come back. He beca he's a king of, of the Persian Empire. He raises the throne. He, it wasn't only for the Jewish people he did this. But he said, you can go back. And so they went back. And then the, uh, the prophets again began encouraging the people. So this is the same chart we were just looking at, right? A little condensed. And here's where the prophets fit in it. Um, I'll, I'll print this off for next week, by the way. And then I'll let you guys be filling this in. And we'll be putting this chart up a lot. So each week when I talk about a specific prophet, I can say, this is who they're talking to. This is where they're at. This is kind of what's going on. Okay, so it's, you'll be able to say, oh, we're, today we're talking about Hosea. Who is Hosea? Hosea is a prophet, as you look at the top, into Israel. Um, and he spoke to the northern kingdom. He actually spoke to the northern kingdom pretty quickly before it was conquered by the Assyrians. Rebuking them and letting them know why what was happening was happening. And we see these different, these different men of God and the messages they gave and the different audiences they had. Now, as we're doing that, you say, okay, so... Refresh me again. Why is Jonah up here in a box and Nahum and Obadiah? Well, that's because they, they spoke to other countries. Their primary audience was to speak um, Nahum and Jonah um, to Nineveh, the Assyrians, and Obadiah to Edom. So their, their primary message was to other countries that God gave a message for. Now, along with this, we, uh, we also have, and I'll just stick these on there just so you can see them, the ones in yellow, that's, that's the other prophets that aren't listed um, because of the major prophets. They're Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. Um, Isaiah, he was in Judah. Really, like I've already said, his, his message had scope. It was not just for Judah, but he lived in Judah. Um, he ministered during the time of King Hezekiah um, and others. Um, and so he was proclaiming it. Jeremiah was a little later. He was at the end when the kingdom had completely gone off the rails. And then Ezekiel and Daniel, like I said, primarily during the exile. Um, of course, just by means of example, there are always guys like Elijah and Elisha around. 
Um, there's more than just them, although the Bible devotes a considerable amount of time to their lives. Um, and they were ministering quite early in Israel. And there was other prophets, men of God, speaking for God. They just didn't write things down because God did not call them to write things down. Now, in the case of Elijah and Elisha, other their deeds are recorded in Scripture. So this we're going to look at. And it's not going to be this chart-driven in the future. We're going back now to the biblical text. We'll be driven out of it. But what you, what you need to understand is sometimes you're like, I have no idea what Jeremiah is talking about. Well, what Jeremiah is talking about is the country messed up, and they need to be rebuked. And actually, they're beyond being rebuked. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. And yet, Jeremiah, in this book of doom and gloom, and that seems pretty gloomy, also has some of the greatest messages of hope. That You know that verse, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord? That's from Jeremiah. That was something that he said, to give you a hope and a future. And we see that even when there's judgment, even when there's rebuking, even when there's a time of trial, that is not God's last word. And so we'll see that even when we look at people like him. Actually, we won't be looking at him, so you can read that on your own. But uh, So that's, that's who we're going to look at. The major prophets, um, we're, we'll skip. We'll let you do that on your own. Or just go to one of J.W.'s Sunday school classes when he ta tackles Ezekiel. Have fun with those wheels within wheels. Um, but here's the, uh, here's the thing. What I want us to do is, first of all, is to be able to connect the pieces. Uh, the Bible does say that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful, right? And if we, if we, we remember those words, it's God-breathed, it's useful for teaching and correction and rebuking, and we know these things. If that's all Scripture, well, that means the minor prophets, even if we don't understand them. So I want to help, help you understand them. So we have a complete picture and not just rotating the same 12 Bible stories. How do these fit in? Because you know what? Part of the reason these things really matter are because Jesus quoted from these prophets. And sometimes he drew illustrations. So even when you're reading the Gospels, sometimes you may not catch it until you look in the notes of your Bible. Jesus is alluding exactly the words that he has spoken through his messengers before. And we can see God will draw parallels of what has happened with what is happening and with what will happen. And some of the prophets also used this amazing device that was God-given, of course, where there would be a fulfillment, an initial fulfillment, that would also have a secondary later fulfillment. Like, for example, I already used the one, and the virgin will be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, we're not exactly sure what's going on with Isaiah talking to the king, um, but what it seems to be is God's going to give a sign that, that the... Because the word in, in Greek, I'm not Greek, in Hebrew, the same word for young woman and virgin is the same word, right? Because they're assumed to be one and the same. And he's saying, when, the, when the, this child is going to be born, but they're saying, really, the prophecy is about Jesus Christ, but I'm going to give you a down payment here. I'm going to give you like a little Costco sample of what this will look like. It's called a type. You're like, you're going to come in. Let me show you kind of what this is going to look like in the future to confirm that this message will be true down the road. And and. We're going to see that as well. And that's, that's really interesting when you see how God weds those two messages. Um, and we're also going to say, well, if Jesus cared about these, these writings, shouldn't we care about them? You know, and, and, that's, and that's really what we should think. So many times we're like, oh, it's the Old Testament. It's old. It's dusty. We've got the New Testament. Well, certainly we do. And we, we, we rejoice for that. We rejoice that the hope has been culminated, that when we look back, we're not waiting just for Jesus to come and wondering how it's going to look. We can see him in the Gospels and the grace that he shows us. Um, yes, we still hope for his, his next coming and, and for him setting all things right. But um, looking back under, lets us understand where we've come from. Uh, we also uh, will have a better understanding on how we should respond. And that's one thing that we need to do, is there's challenges in the minor prophets. Mostly the people back then failed, and we just showed you, and they paid the price. But we as people who are also called, as the people of God, need to learn and say, what has God declared and how will I respond? Will I be hard of hearing, will, or will I open my heart to receive that what God has, speaking, what has said? Will we be like the Ninevites when Jonah went to Nineveh and Jonah didn't even want to give the message? He hated those people. But they responded, they repented, they changed their way, and God said, you know what? I will relent. And for a generation, he relented until the time of Nahum when they returned back to their wicked ways. Or will we, will we be like, the, like King Jehoiakim 
And that's when Jeremiah came in and said, Thus says the Lord. And he brought a scroll of what God had said. And what did Jehoiakim do? He took out his knife and cut it piece by piece and threw it to the fire. See, there, there are lessons to be learned. Some are exactly what God said, and some are like, we need to do better than that. Because, you know what? God has not changed. That's true. But neither have people. We have the same heart that's prone to wander, that's prone to only hear what we want to hear. It's prone to putting our own thoughts in the place of God's thoughts and declaring them to be God's thoughts. But we need to listen to his word and say, how will I respond? Will I be obedient and loyal and steadfast? Or will we be like those who went before and turn away? Well, I, I am I'm excited about this. Um, originally, I had planned something different for the summer, and then I realized we've preached through the book of Habakkuk, we've preached through the book of Jonah, and we've preached through the book of Malachi. But in my time here, we haven't touched much of the others. And I thought it was just a really good time this summer to take the opportunity to fill in the gaps. Because if God has written it, it's worth reading. And if he has spoken it, we need to heed his voice. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. And I thank you for what we're going to have the opportunity to look at this summer. And um, I pray that it will be useful to us as we grow in our, in our knowledge and understanding of you. I pray that we would have the courage and, and determination to apply the things which you will teach us. And we also thank you so much, God, that the words which you have spoken through your prophets so many years ago, you have already brought so many of these things to pass, and most importantly, the sending of your Son to save us from our sins. And we thank you, God, for Jesus and what he has done. And that you keep your word. Help us now to be faithful in following it as well. In Jesus' name, amen.